So yeah, a bit more about the, the background for me. I sort of did allude to, I sort of wanted to be a, a theoretical physicist when I started as an undergraduate. Took a heavy physics and math track and both rapidly realized that I wasn't quite that good at math. But also that, that, that astronomy is more interesting, that the kind of questions we're trying to answer in astronomy are questions that I can explain in one of these lectures. And that by the end of this, by the end of this class, you may not have your own favorite answers to the fundamental questions in astronomy, but you'll know what those fundamental questions are and really understand them in a way that's not necessarily true for, for modern theoretical physics. And that's part of what I like best about it. It's also a field where small groups can make differences in, in research. The questions are tractable at the level of a, a faculty member and some postdocs, um, though, though increasingly moving into large scale science. And it's a field, as we'll keep seeing, a theme for this has progressed incredibly rapidly um, over the past 20 or 30 years as technology has let us make new discoveries. Um, mostly what I study are extrasolar planets. So that's in the course description. That means planets that are orbiting stars other than our sun. And when I went to, when I entered graduate school, there were no extrasolar planets known. The only planets known were the ones in our solar system. Now, as we'll see later in this lecture, there's more than, than 2,000. Um, a lot of this I did have done using a telescope in Chile. That's the Gemini South Telescope on a mountain in the southern end of the Andes. Um, these days, I don't actually get to go to the mountain anymore. We just control it over the internet from a room in the basement of the Physics and Astro Building. So pictures like that don't show up as much. Um, um, I'm somewhat involved, but not heavily involved in space telescopes. And what my group does in particular is study extrasolar planets. So we'll hear about this towards the end of the course by actually taking pictures of them. What you're seeing, I got to get used to this fact that there's so many different screens. I won't be insulted if people look at the screens that are closer to them in the back because the print must be incredibly hard to, to read here. So you know, com feel completely free to point at your closest screen um, rather than feeling obliged to point at me. Um, what you're seeing here is a whole other solar system. There's a star in the center, blo actually blocked by a little metal mask, but kind of glinting off the edge of the little metal mask. But around it are four planets, um, similar to Jupiter on our solar system, a bit bigger, a bit hotter, for reasons we'll find out, uh, find out later orbiting around it. But you're actually seeing an image of a big chunk of an entire other solar system. Um, I also have a now seven-year-old daughter um, who's keen on wolves. You can see the wolf in the bottom corner. And moderately keen on science. We went to see the total solar eclipse last year um, in Idaho. So here you can see the wolf is wearing protective sunglasses because you don't want to burn your eyes out even if you're a wolf. Um, well, my daughter is sort of measuring the diameter of the, the eclipse um, through the duration of the eclipse with a little solar telescope viewer. Sadly, we're not getting any total solar eclipses during this class. But if the sun turns out to be in one of its less boring phases, we might use devices like this to take a look at sunspots um, later on in the quarter, though the sun has been tending um, towards boring. Um, so goals, what are we doing here? We also, as you probably noticed, we have two introductory astrophysics courses, physics 15 and 16. And they overlap by about this much, which, which makes them a bit odd as a sequence. This is the one that's local. We study the parts of our universe that are, relatively speaking, close to um, the sun. And we'll go through that in a series of sequences. We'll first study the tools of astronomy, reminding people of some stuff um, from physics classes or some stuff you haven't seen in physics classes. Unlike, say, chemistry, we can't go touch the stuff that we're studying for, for the most part. We interact with it almost exclusively through light, the light that other objects emit. And we collect those light with our telescopes of various sorts. So to understand what light tells us about the universe, we have to understand how objects produce light and how the light they produce is affected by their composition, by their temperature, by their state. So we'll spend a while couple of weeks, um, first couple of weeks, kind of reviewing some of the physics of how light is emitted and collected. As we study objects, we can't push them. We can only see how they respond to other forces in the universe. The other force in the universe is pretty much always gravity. And so we'll talk about how objects move, how planets orbit the sun, and how they respond to gravity. And then we'll also talk about telescopes, the stuff we study we do the collecting of the light with, largely because I think telescopes are cool. And I'm kind of on the, the spectrum of astronomers. There's, there's people who sit in their offices and just have whiteboards and do very detailed math calculations. They're called astrophysicists. There's people who gather data so that the people who do the stuff with the whiteboard have things to try and explain with their models. And then there's people who actually build telescopes and cameras and stuff like that. And I'm somewhere on that spectrum of, of stuff. So I like to take the opportunity to talk about telescopes. Also, because it is really why we have all this progress. We'll talk about the motion of stars and planets and the moon through the sky. We'll do some exercises as part of the homework involving looking at, for example, the way the moon differs over a whole lunar cycle and connecting it to visualizing in our, um, how the moon is moving around the Earth. 
We'll, won't do a lot of history in this class. One structure you could build classes like this around is kind of the history of astronomy from ancient Greeks um, through the Renaissance through today. We'll talk about that a little bit today, but we're not going to focus on it. I'm not qualified to teach history of science, and the goal is to teach, teach the underlying science. We'll go through our solar system, the eight or nine, depending on which side of the argument you're on, planets that are present in our solar system, what we know about them from spacecraft visiting them, um, and what that, those properties tell us about how our solar system formed. That's really one of the big, surprisingly unsettled questions in astronomy. Where do other solar systems come from? Where does our solar system come from? It's actually something, again, grad school, they told me we understood how solar systems formed. Turned out they were wrong, and we're still kind of trying to recover with all, um, come up with theories that fit all the observations about it. But we'll still teach the old school version of this and talk about how it's modified for other solar systems. We'll talk about stars our sun in detail, because of course that's the most important star to us, it influences our, our daily lives, um, and other stars. Stars go through life cycles, just like uh, almost anything. How stars are born, how they evolve over the course of their life, how they um, die, what they're composed of, what we know about their insides and outsides. We'll talk about the structure and evolution of our galaxy, the collection of hundreds of billions of stars um, all orbiting together. And that's kind of where we stop. That's where the border between us and Physics 16 is. We won't talk about the universe as a whole, about the Big Bang, about the expansion of it. Um, I'm happy to answer individual questions about that, though I'll probably answer them badly. But that's sort of the distinction. Physics 50, 16 doesn't do planets, um, but does do the Big Bang. And so if you're more interested in that and you can take Physics 16, I won't be insulted if you decide to switch to it, except that planets are much cooler than the, the Big Bang, so you should stay in here. Um, and so uh, towards the end, we'll talk about these extrasolar planets. I'll tease a bunch of that now, but it's really what we'll cycle back to because understanding stars and understanding galaxies help us put other planets in, in, um, into context. We really still in a, uh, I'll talk about the sort of great revolutions in thinking in, um, triggered by people like Copernicus. We're in a new version of that right now where we now understand that not only is our solar system is not unique, but also maybe planets are everywhere, but also maybe not typical. What does that tell us about the uh, likelihood of, of, say, life existing elsewhere? And then the last lecture we usually spend to discuss things like the prospects of life elsewhere in the galaxy. That's an extraordinarily speculative topic. There's a lot we don't know about how life formed on this planet, even less about how intelligence evolved on this planet or how it's going to evolve going forward. But something that, again, has changed is we can at least discuss parts of that quantitatively. We know that say a planet is a precursor to life, for the most part, and we know how many planets there are out there. We know something about the odds that a planet will have the kind of atmosphere that our Earth does. So although none of us, no one honestly can say what the odds are that there's another life-bearing planet or intelligent civilization close to the Earth, we do have a framework that will allow us to discuss it intelligently and quantitatively, and that's really what we're developing through this course and what we'll finish with the, the last lecture. And then an additional kind of side learning goal, more not related to the subject, but related to just ways to think about data, is we'll spend a lot of time looking at various presentations of data, charts and graphs, and how they convey information. That's something I'm interested in and something everybody should at least be aware of. You see charts and graphs on the web as people talk about the economy or something like that. There's a lot of ways charts and graphs can tell misleading stories. There's a lot of ways they can tell real and accurate stories. And so learning a little bit both how to read things, which you're familiar with, and how to create charts that that convey information properly is something we'll do a little bit of um, too. I tend to find it easier to digest information if it's in the form of some kind of plot as opposed to tables of numbers, and hopefully that's true for, for other people too. So any questions? Let me, oh yes, what we, so what we won't cover, we won't do history of science. We draw this line basically at the edge of our galaxy and we stop there, though I can talk about it a little bit. We won't do cosmology in the Big Bang. We won't do a lot of kind of black holes and exotic physics associated with them. Again, that's something you could fill up an entire lecture with. We'll talk a little bit about black holes as the end game of the life of stars or the one that's in the center of our galaxy, but we're not going to talk about quantum gravity and string theory and stuff like that. Those are really more the purview of physics 16 and 17. Um, but I'm open to suggestions if there's topics you feel are get neglected, like how gamma ray bursts could wipe out all life on Earth. I'm always happy to, to tweak the um, course a little bit, so feedback or, or questions are good. So, any questions on the, the curriculum side or any topics people are wondering if we're going to cover or always been deeply curious about? Like I said, first lecture is not usually very questiony. You've probably, probably noticed that. Um, hopefully, we'll get more so as we go forward. 
There's also a bunch of stuff that we're going to cover, but we don't actually know the answers to. Again, that's kind of why I like astronomy. I think in a first year physics class, there's essentially nothing you can present to the audience that people don't know the answer to, that you can present in a way that the audience will understand. There are unanswered questions in physics. There, there are 40 pages of math. There's a bunch of stuff we'll talk about that I can't say I know the answer to. I don't know how other solar systems formed. We have theories. Those theories make predictions, but they're not really supported by all the data we have so far. We don't even really know how our solar system formed. A really big question we don't know is, even though we do know now, and it's a tremendous development, that planets are incredibly common, we don't know if solar systems like our own, with our particular arrangement of planets, are common or not. The instruments we have can't quite see the equivalent of Earth or the equivalent of Jupiter yet. They can see different sorts of planets. Um, and in turn, we don't know if the arrangement we have is critical to having life or not. And so as part of that, we can't say whether habitable planets, planets that have rocky interiors, little tiny thin atmosphere with just the right amount of stuff on it, are rare or common in the universe. And we can't say definitively whether life is common elsewhere in, the in um, our galaxy. That being said, it's probably we will know the answers to these questions in your lifetime and possibly even mine. We're reaching the point where we can build next generations of telescopes that will answer these questions that could, for example, see a planet like Earth and look at it and say there's oxygen and there's water and maybe there's even chlorophyll um, present on its surface. That's probably 20 years out, but it's realistic to see that we're going to see the answer to, to questions like that. So, so I will spend a certain amount of time, though, saying, yeah, we don't know the answer to that, but I'll at least try to explain intelligently what the range of alternatives are um, and share my uncertainty with everybody um, in the class. OK. And as I also said, another theme of this is a lot of this progress is enabled by advances in technology and telescopes. Um, and so we'll do a bunch of that, that going forward. We're living in an era where really amazing pieces of machinery have been developed. The Hubble Space Telescope, the sort of, um, you know, I'm not used to how the laser bounces off that, the most famous um, of, of telescopes, but also big ground-based telescopes like the Gemini Observatory that I use. And also, and Stanford relevant, by advances in computation and data. Astronomy is producing huge volumes of data and things like machine learning are allowing us to sift through that and find patterns that humans might not have noticed. Um, detectors are getting more sensitive. The you know, camera in this thing is about 20 times, has 20 times more pixels than the state-of-the-art astronomy camera I used for most of my PhD thesis. That's allowing us to produce these huge volumes of data and learn things on scales that we really couldn't have, have before, the combinations of, of advances in sensors, advances in telescopes, but really advances in software has moved astronomy forward very rapidly. And telescopes come in all different flavors. Again, we'll talk about them from stuff that you recognize as telescopes to stuff that you kind of recognize as radio telescopes to something in the South Pole where they've um, dug um, a couple of thousand holes in the ice to detect particles that can pass through ice um, um, and pass through the entire Earth, in fact. Okay, so I said not much history, but I'm going to do a little history because I like it as a way to, to show progress. So you sort of know, 2,000 years ago, um, the, the view of the universe, ancient Greeks or equivalents, was basically that there was an Earth and there was a bunch of stuff that wasn't the Earth and everything that wasn't the Earth went around the Earth. That's a fairly obvious um, model to have. If you watch stuff, stars over the course of a night, the first thing you notice is that they rise and set. You don't feel like you're moving, so you assume they have to be moving while you're standing still. If you watch longer, if you watch the moon, you notice over the course of a month, the time the moon rises and sets changes, so you realize it's moving with respect to the sun and the stars. If you watch the planets even longer, they move in similar ways. And a simple model of that which would make you think that they're all just going around, around the Earth and that we're the center of it. In detail, and we'll talk about this as we go into motions of stars and planets, that turns out to be a very bad model. The motion of a planet like Mars is not just smoothly across the sky, but over the course of years, it makes kind of backwards and forwards loops that are inconsistent with the idea that we're just in the center of a bunch of simple circularly moving things. And of course, that was explained um, more successfully in, um, by people like um, Kepler and Copernicus and Tycho, who real, put together a consistent model in which the sun was at the center. At that time, they thought of the entire universe. Um, the Earth and all the other planets went around it. We were no longer special. 
They did that mathematically. They came up with mathematical models on that spectrum. They were sort of the astrophysicists, the people who wrote down a set of equations that said, if the sun is the center of the universe, then next Tuesday, this is where Mars is going to be based on my understanding of how it moves. Six, then Tuesday, they went and looked and they saw Mars was there. The models were sort of proved um, and refined by later astronomers through development of more and more physics. Um, an interesting other piece of that, though, that's more the sort of astronomer piece was Galileo. So he was the first, not the inventor of the telescope, but he was the first person to point a telescope at the sky. One of the first things he did with it was look at Jupiter, big bright thing, hard to miss in the sky. And he noticed first that it wasn't just a point, it was a little disk, and that there were four little stars next to it. And then he looked the next night, and those four little stars were in a different position. And he looked the next night, and the next night, and the next night, and saw that those stars were moving, and realized they were independent objects orbiting around Jupiter. And we now know that those are moons of Jupiter, and now we've sent spacecraft to fly by them, and we know a huge amount about, about their properties. But it was really the first realization that the Earth didn't have to be this, or the first observation that the Earth didn't have to be the center, that things could actually move around something other than um, um, the Earth. And it's sort of interesting that, that that kind of visually compelling thing, the fact that you could, you know, the, the math that Kepler and Copernicus did did not get them into particular trouble with, say, the authorities of the church. It was a very esoteric, detailed argument. Galileo wrote it down in a way that anybody could understand. You can look through a telescope and you can see the Earth is not the center because stuff is orbiting it. That more, in a way, got him into, of course, you can tell why I don't talk about history because that's completely ignoring the differences between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and, and the um, other religious stuff happening at the time. Um, but there is something compelling about just looking through a telescope and seeing this. And this is something we actually can see now with just binoculars. Okay. And part of why I like that is getting back to the extrasolar planets, if this movie will behave itself. That's kind of the modern equivalent. This is 10 years of data on the system of extrasolar planets that my group discovered about 10 years ago. The star, again, is hidden in the center where the little star symbol is, blocked by a big black mask. What, the light that's kind of boiling around it isn't real. That's just light glinting off the edge of the mask. But the little dots that are moving are real. Those are four planets, each of them about three to five times the mass of Jupiter. They're moving exactly the way Kepler would have predicted they were moving if he had written down his equations 500 years ago, exactly the way Galileo saw the moons move around Jupiter, except in this case, he was seeing Jupiter from the edge, so the moons were going around like this. We're seeing this almost face on, so the planets are going around like this. These planets, you can see, take a very long time to orbit their star. In these 10 years, they haven't finished the entire orbit yet. Um, one of my goals in life is to see the one in the center complete an orbit, so I'm trying to like exercise and eat well and things like that. Um, predictions say we got about another 30 years to go. Um, the outer one is about 800 years, so I'm not going to see that. Um, but the fact that we can see Kepler's laws, that we can see what Galileo saw, except in a whole other system of planets, is one of the most amazing things in my professional astronomer life. This is just my favorite movie ever, and I can watch it for a, a very, very long time. But we'll also learn through this class for this and for equivalent movies involving, say, stars orbiting giant black holes, um, the physics of what, it, of what these things can tell us. The motion of these planets can tell us things about how far they are from their star, um, whether they're as close as Jupiter or as far as Pluto. It can tell us things like the mass of the star. It can tell us things about whether the orbits are going in circles or ellipses, and we'll learn some of the math that will let us do that um, going forward. We also can study what these things are made out of. We can used the techniques we'll talk about to discover what the atmospheres of these planets are like. The spoiler is because they're like Jupiter, their atmosphere is not oxygen or chlorophyll or water or anything like that. But someday, again 20 years, we're going to have the technology that will let us do this for a solar system just like our own and you're going to see little dots going around that are going to be Earths and that we're going to have evidence that there's life on those Earths. Okay, come on, bad computer. Better. Okay. Um, any questions about the massively oversimplified history and the, the context for this? Yeah. What was the black in the middle and like why is it? I'll, I'll talk about it a little more um, towards the end when we get back to it. But the short version is stars are much, much brighter than planets. In this case, the stars are about a million times brighter than a planet. So imagine if you're trying to take a picture of a bird next to the sun with your phone or something like that. The glare from the sun will just swamp the bird. And so inside our camera, there's a little metal mask that basically blocks the star, kind of like holding your thumb up to block the sun um, and make the birds, or planets in this case, visible around it. 
there's also a huge amount of image processing that went into this. And so, so some of that is related to the image processing. But basically, it's that we've held up our thumb to block the bright star so we can see the, the faint stuff next to it. That's a good question. Any other questions on this? Um, we have looked by now at 600 stars, um, and we found about six of these. So, so to some extent, I mean, lucky in the sense of we were very systematic and looked at a lot of them. So yeah, we didn't know these planets were going to be there beforehand, and they could have been orbiting like this, in which case we might have still seen them. If they were going around and around in the sky like this, we'd see them some of the time, but other times they'd be close to the star and behind the black mask that you were you were asking about. So there's an element of luck, but really an element of just systematic planning that we looked at a lot of stars. And that's part of what I was alluding to in terms of sort of big data revolutions. We could do that because we have the, the software to do this. We don't have to have a poor grad student staring at, at 600 images identifying stuff. Um, uh, Although it, it also turned out we found this on like star number 50 and it was just the, it's the best we've ever seen and the star 51 through 600 much less exciting unfortunately. That's always the way um, these things work. Um, but, um, and again we'll talk towards the end about what allowed us to make what properties the star had that made it a good target in some ways for these observations. Other questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about scale of the universe and kind of our, our cosmic address. Um, uh, so I did my PhD at UCLA. So when I first did teaching, it was just as a teaching assistant in um, courses like this. And in UCLA, you know, the median student in the room was probably writing a screenplay. And so my goal in, of this was to make sure nobody, when they wrote that screenplay, got galaxies and solar systems confused. That's probably less of a, an issue up here, but I talk about sort of the difference between those, between those things as we move to different scales. Um, and so we're going to start with kind of our solar system, the collection of planets moving around the sun, move to our galaxy. Like I said, not allowed to go to the rest of the universe because that's, that's um, Professor Wexler's job in Physics 16. But give us some sense of where, where we are. We're on a planet. It is orbiting a star in our solar system. That star is one of hundreds of billions in our whole galaxy. The galaxy is part of a group of galaxies, and the whole thing assembles into a universe scale. Let's start. I'll see if this runs. It's a little um, poppy, and I won't, my heart won't be broken if it doesn't run. Oh, you're not going to run. Bad movie. OK. I was going to do one of those gratuitous zooming in and out of the scale of the, the universe things. Again, irritatingly. There we go. So you run on that. Let's try that again. Nope. Like I said, I only found out Monday I was using this room. Usually I'd be testing videos. So there we go. OK. Um, this is an American Museum of Natural History video, again, just to give you a sense of, of these scales. I won't spend a lot of time doing kind of PR videos like this, but I kind of like this one. Um, it takes a set of, of real data about the positions of stars, extrapolated data about stars that we don't know about, but we're sort of sure statistically <laughs> exist, plots them in three-dimensional space, and gives you a sense of, of where they're located. And most modern planetariums can do things like this. So, now, all of us, of course, have access to various tools in Google and good 3D maps of the Earth. This is to sort of realistic scale. So as you get a significant distance from the Earth, the three-dimensionality of the surface goes away. Mountains are small compared to the diameter of the, the entire Earth. As we pull out further, we'll get a sense of the scale of the Earth compared to other aspects of the solar system. Leaving out one layer. The nearest objects to the Earth that aren't the Earth are actually all man-made. There's an enormous number of, of human-made satellites um, orbiting around the Earth that I think it's going to animate successfully. Here we go. Um, most of them clustered close to the Earth um, because they have to do things like take pictures of the Earth. It's a bunch of them clustered further out um, in particular orbits that allow them to perform particular scientific or technical tasks. Um, on larger scales, pulling out. I, mean, I really need a version of this movie that runs about twice as fast. Um, there we go. You can see to scale the, the sun, um, apparently similar in size to the Earth, but as we'll see, much smaller. The satellite cloud, almost everything we've ever launched is relatively close to the Earth compared to, say, the nearest natural body, the moon. Um, 
then now on this scale we can see the orbits of the other planets around the sun, most of them going in the same direction, um, counterclockwise as viewed from above for some broad definition of above, most of them orbiting in the same flat orientation. We'll talk about why that's true. The other large planets, um, this is an institution that doesn't like Pluto, so Pluto doesn't appear on the, on the figure. We'll actually talk a little bit about why it is and isn't a planet. Maybe we'll do a debate. Um, they've adjusted now the brightness of the sun to its real brightness. If the sun had been its real brightness, we never would have seen any of those planets, just, just like in, in my image. Now we're seeing nearby stars. And it's hard to get a sense of the time scale, but the distance between these stars is enormous compared to the scale of our solar system. That's about how far out the radio signals that we've sent since we've had radio transmissions have gone. That's the bubble that could be aware we have a technological civilization. And it's a tiny fraction of the scale of the entire galaxy. Moving out further, there's other galaxies nearby, other collections of hundreds of billions of stars. And then moving out still further, you start to see structure in those galaxies. And here you're starting to see the selection effects of being human. Not so much that all the galaxies are in a giant hourglass shape, but that all telescopes tend to be located in particular locations, and so they can't see the whole sky. Or so that our galaxy gets in the way, in fact, and you can't see other galaxies. <laughs> so their galaxies are actually distributed pretty uniformly. It just looks like there's more in some areas than others, because that's where we have our telescopes. On very, very large scales as we move out, we see beyond, far enough back in time that we're seeing beyond when galaxies have formed into the kind of leftover light um, from the original Big Bang. But again, not allowed to talk about the Big Bang too much, but, but might do it as an extra topic towards the end. And we'll skip the, the zooming in, I think. Some of what you're seeing, though, is real. The kind of filamentary web structure is related to how galaxies actually form, how they're located in three-dimensional space. You can kind of see hints of that three-dimensional web as we zoom back into our galaxy our local group of galaxies, and then back into the Milky Way. The little dots around the Milky Way are other galaxies much smaller than our satellites that we share our space with, and then into the spiral and where our star is actually going to be located. Okay, skip through that. So focusing on scales first, I want to talk about the scale of our solar system. It's a hard thing. Another problem with astronomy is kind of getting our heads around um, the numbers involved. And we sort of have an intuition that everything is about the same size. We're used to dealing with objects like people, like cars, like elephants. They vary maybe by factors of 10, but not by amounts compared to the, the scale things vary in space. So um, metaphorical scale to compare the sun and other planets. Um, I didn't have time to go by the grocery store, so I didn't bring a sun. But the sun, we could imagine a model system in which the sun is roughly the size of a decent sized grapefruit. So the sun would be about um, this big. On that scale, Jupiter would be a large blueberry or a marble about that big. Jupiter being the biggest, is the biggest planet in the solar system. It's about a thousand times smaller in mass than the sun. Also on that scale, Earth would be getting towards the, the small peppercorn um, or head of a ballpoint pen scale. Earth substantially smaller than the sun or the other planets in our solar system. Um, what, and that you can kind of get your head around. You could imagine that I had brought a grapefruit and a, and a blueberry and visualized them. The distances get harder to, to cope with. So if we took that scale, if the solar system was the size of a grapefruit, the Earth would be close to the back, probably a little bit outside the back of this classroom. Um, uh, Mercury and Venus, the next smaller planets, um, which would be kind of, um, again, head of a ballpoint pen size, would be just barely inside this classroom. So to scale, our solar system would consist of a grapefruit and two tiny little balls somewhere around the, the back wall with almost nothing um, in between them. This is a overlaid on a map of Stanford, um, readjusted when I found out we were going to be in this room, give or take uh, uh, which side of the building the room is on. So yeah, Mercury, Venus, Earth would sort of just be barely at the edge of the building, Mars probably, probably outside the building relative to where we're standing now. So, so most of the inner solar system would be empty space. On that scale, moving out, um, Jupiter would be kind of at the edge of the main quad. So the next biggest thing, which still only the size of a, a large blueberry, um, would be somewhere around the edge of the main quad. Saturn, a little bit smaller on the far side of the main quad. Uranus and Neptune, the other planets, about this big. Um, I drew the line going out in my direction, so across the engineering and science quad. Neptune kind of at the far end of the engineering quad. Pluto, if it's technically a planet, um, outside campus getting into the med school. So our solar system. There's almost no way to imagine visualizing it all at once. You can't really look and picture a grapefruit here 
and something the, the, the size of a grain of sand um, all the way across campus. The solar system is an incredibly empty space um, by any reasonable scale. So I'm going to stop for a second as I talk about our solar system and talk a little bit about then how to visualize it. So one way to visualize it would be to, you know, we could actually do this sometime, is create a model like that across our solar system and play find the planet as you all look for a blueberry hidden somewhere in the middle of the quad. Probably not a good use of our collective time. So instead we'll try to show that with graphs. Um, scatter plots like this, plots that show two numbers for every object, are a very common way to visualize data in science. And I'm sure you've seen them in classes that you've taken before. In this case, on the x-axis, I have the size of the orbit of something in kilometers. And on the y-axis, I have the mass of the planet, how much it weighs um, in kilograms. Um, this is actually, though, a pretty bad example of how to show data like that. Um, for example, it's almost impossible to distinguish between the masses. It's hard to look at this graph and say, even if you're sitting right next to it, is Earth bigger than Venus, for example, because they're too squeezed up um, in the corner. And so a first trick we use a lot in visualizing data is not to plot the quantity itself. Um, here's the same thing, just with a, a little bit cleaner plotting. Not to plot the quantity itself, but to plot the logarithm of it. So here, rather than plotting the, the um, radius of the orbit and the mass of the planet, I've plotted them on a logarithmic scale. So each step is not um, a million kilometers. Each step is a factor of 10. 10 million kilometers, 100 million kilometers, a billion kilometers, 10 billion kilometers. And I've done the same thing on the mass scale. And that's a very useful way to visualize data that occupies um, a broad range to let you see both small numbers and big numbers with respect to each other. On a graph like this, each step corresponds to about the same amount of multiplication. So the, the ratio, the um, Earth's mass, say, divided by Mercury's mass is similar to the ratio of Jupiter's mass divided by Neptune's mass. Again, I'm apologizing to the back of the classroom people because I'm still trying to figure out how to use this space successfully. But we'll do a better job um, next lecture. And this kind of graph, though, so aside from letting you see the numbers, and you can say, is Jupiter bigger than Earth? Yes. Is Earth bigger than Venus? Yes, by a little bit. Um, graphs like this start to tell us stories and start to see patterns. And so if you look at this, you might, depending on how you choose to visualize things, see the planets kind of make two groups. There's really two <laughs> distinct set of planets. There's a bunch down here. What are their, their kind of distinguishing characteristics? Size. They're relatively small. Closeness to the sun, they're relatively close to the sun. And there's a group up here. There's a bunch of planets that are far from the sun, and they're also much, much, much bigger than the others. And in our solar system, at least, there's nothing else. There's no planets that are small but far from the sun, and there's no planets that are big and close to their sun. So even from these two numbers, size of the planet and the, the mass, you can kind of classify the planets into two distinct categories. And that's a very astronomer thing to do. If you give an astronomer a pile of toys, they'll immediately sort them into two subpiles based on and refer to them as type 1 toys and type 2 toys. Um, in this case, we'll refer to them as, as giant planets and terrestrial or rocky planets. And we'll, as we talk about our solar system, we'll understand what the difference between those is. The other thing, though, that's terrible about this graph um, is the numbers are just so big, 10 to the 24 kilograms. I mean, who in the room has any idea in their head what 10 to the 24 kilograms are? I don't. Um, a billion kilometers, that's a little better because you can kind of imagine a billion of something if you try really hard, but it's not great. And so something I try really hard to do in this class is find what I would refer to as the natural units. To not use a kilometer, which was some yardstick some revolutionary French person thought was reasonable to do the size of the Earth, or a kilogram, which is some lump of platinum sitting in Paris, but to compare objects to each other. For the solar system, the natural unit for distance is something we unimaginatively call the astronomical unit and somewhat um, um, egocentrically just defined as the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So the basic unit of distance we'll use as we explore the solar system is this astronomical unit. For mass, you could make a bunch of choices depending on what your favorite planet is. But again, we're egotistical, so we'll pick the Earth as our standard unit of mass. And so here's the same graph now in units of astronomical units and in units of, mass, of Earth masses. And so from that, you can sort of fairly easily answer questions like, how much bigger is Jupiter than the Earth? How many, more time, how many more times further than the sun it is? And when I give you calculations to do with this, you're not multiplying numbers like 10 to the 24 by 10 to the 9. You're multiplying numbers like 10 by 100 or something like that. So wherever possible, we'll try to do problems in these natural unit sets and present data in these natural unit sets. Because there's really no point in remembering 10 to the 24 or 10 to the 33. 
excuse me, or anything like that. The other thing that's on this graph now is I've color coded discoveries of other planets by their method they were discovered by. And we'll talk about those methods towards the end of class. But I just want to show the story. And this is the, the time I entered grad school. There were actually nine planets, because back then Pluto was a planet. But on this graph, Pluto would have dropped below the, the bottom of the axis, so I wouldn't have to worry about um, showing it or not. And there's the distinction between the two classes of planets that you could sort things in. Um, around the time I was a postdoc, we started to discover the first planets in other solar systems, and then discovered more. And by this point, it was kind of already obvious we had a problem which is these are not like the planets in our solar system. They're as big as Jupiter or they're bigger, but they're close to their star. The idea that every other solar system should resemble our own, that we should have these two natural categories of planets, turned out to be wrong. And wrong in some ways as embarrassingly as Ptolemy, thinking that we had to be the center of the universe. Astronomers thought every solar system had to be like our own. That turns out not to be the case. And we're still trying to figure out the implications of that. 2004, and now where we are in 2018, there's thousands of planets known orbiting other stars. Um, almost none of them like our own solar system. That doesn't mean solar systems like our own don't exist. As we'll find out, there's kind of a selection effect. We're not sensitive to solar systems exactly like our own yet. We're still trying to build better, better technology to do that. Um, but, but definitely, there's a lot out there that are different than our solar system enormously. And by the end of the class, we'll sort of navigate this diagram and understand at least some of, of the story it's telling us about the way the universe is arranged. And so I kind of allude to we're in this last phase of a post-Copernican revolution of realizing that our solar system is not only not the center of the universe, but different. Yeah, sorry. Um, graph of planets. So how many of these are orbiting sun that's in their around? That's a really good question. Um, about, I would guess without looking it up that about a quarter to a third of them are orbiting suns like our own. And again, we'll talk about that as we, as we go forward. It turns out, and you're, you're probably hinting at knowing this, that our sun, is not all, our sun itself is not all that typical. It's bigger than most other stars. Not the biggest, but, but most stars, it's not, certainly not average. Most stars are smaller than the sun. Um, but the stars that are smaller than the sun are also fainter and so it's harder to discover planets around them and that kind of partially cancels out the fact that there are more stars like this. So, so right now we know probably about twice as many planets around little stars as we do around big stars but that doesn't reflect the universe that just reflects the place where we've been looking the stars that are easier to look around. So, so that's another way in which everything is different than our solar system. They're still very different, interestingly. Um, yeah, you might expect that's a, a, a good hypothesis would be that the kind of star you have determines what kind of planetary system you would get and that the other ones are different because their stars are different. That turned out not to be true for whatever, whatever reasons we're still trying to, to grapple with. With the important caveat that every piece of instrumentation we can build could only barely just now see planets like our own. So we don't have the ability to see Earths around stars like the sun, so there could be a lot of them. We could barely see Jupiter around other stars. So, so it's certainly possible there's more solar systems like our own, but that what we know for sure is there's a lot that are just incredibly different than our own solar system around, ordinary, around sun-like stars, around little stars, even around big stars of all, of all kinds. But yeah, that's a good hypothesis for what could cause it, that it could be related to the, the kind of star you have. And it probably is a little bit. Like for example, the small stars um, don't have anything like Jupiter anywhere. So the small, so all these planets up here, um, the big ones that are Jupiter sized are almost certainly orbiting big sun-like stars. Small stars tend not to have really big planets. That might make some intuitive sense, but, but I don't trust my intuition anymore on this. So I'm not sure I'd believe it. Other questions about the, the diagram? And this is kind of the thing we'll return to towards the end and what, what's in it, but it's good to, I'm, I'm happy to ask questions about the, answer questions about the discoveries we have so far. For a wide variety of ways that um, these stars have been discovered, yeah. is that just based on what tools are available or how easy it is to find stars huh? in a particular area? You can, yeah, and again, we'll talk about it more in detail, what these different methods represent. Um, and you can see some methods are much more successful than others. And that really is related to how hard it is to see a planet using the techniques. For example, the stuff I do, this imaging one, 
where you that refers to actually seeing the planet, the images like the one I showed you otherwise. And you'll notice it's kind of pathetic compared to, to some of the other techniques in terms of sheer volume. Though, of course, our planets are more special because we can see them and actually look at them. But that's mostly because it's really, really, really hard. Everything has to work out exactly right to, to see those planets in ways that I'll talk about. The same thing is true, though, for what are, what are referred to here as transits. I might as well talk about the techniques a little bit. Um, the Doppler technique refers to seeing not the planet itself, but its gravity. The planet's gravity pulls the star, the star wobbles, and we can actually measure that wobble and tell there's something invisible there. And if you have faith, you believe that there's something invisible there is a planet. Um, it's a very long, slow, patient technique, but it's been fairly powerful for discovering planets over uh, um, especially more massive planets. The transit technique, which is now the most successful, refers to when a planet blocks the star. So you've got a bright star, planet passes in front of it. The planet's really small compared to the star. It's the, the um, blueberry next to the grapefruit. But it does block a little bit of the grapefruit. And so you don't see as much light coming from the planet for a few hours while this, well, as from the star, excuse me, for a few hours while the planet is in front of it. The star gets a little bit dimmer. Little bit means about 1%. But we can measure 1%. And in fact, you can literally measure this in your backyard with a decent digital camera hooked up to a, a telescope. Um, and then see that a few hours later, the star gets bright again because the planet's no longer in front of it. Does that make sense to people? Of course, for it to work, you have to get really lucky. What if the planet's doing this? It's never going to block out the star. You know, I, I can't even block the, the star out for everybody in the classroom at the same time. The people in the back of the classroom would see it get dimmer, and now the people in the front would. So the odds of that happening are really slim. The only way you're going to see it is if you look at 100,000 or a million stars. That's impractical to do if you have to have grad students staring at the data. But as part of this sort of big data revolution, we can build cameras big enough to look at a million stars at once. And we can analyze the data from a million stars at once and see that one in a thousand of them get dimmer for a few hours every few days, every few months, because a planet passed in front of them. And so that's been extremely powerful. But also, if you think about it, the odds of that happening go down the further away the planet is from the star. If the planet's way out here, it has to line up exactly in front of the star for you to block it. There's a huge chance that it won't. And so you're seeing here that technique trailing off. Not that there aren't planets they could have seen out here, but just the odds of them lining up are, are tiny. You're lining up the grapefruit. You know, remember our scale of the solar system? It would be the, the blueberry somewhere over um, at the far side of the engineering quad and the grapefruit um, in this classroom. And they have to line up with respect to each other. So you have to be in exactly the right place. The odds that you're in the right place to see that are pretty slim, all things considered. Also, as we'll find out, Planets here take a long time to go around the sun. Planets here take less time to go around the sun. These techniques only work if you watch the planet go all the way around the sun a couple of times. Nobody's going to believe you if you just saw the star get dim once. Maybe a bird flew in front of it or something like that. Um, and so again, there's a selection effect that they like to find planets close to the stars. And what they got lucky is there are a lot of planets close to the stars, many more than there are in our solar system. Other questions? There are online catalogs for this and sort of central, central clearing houses to, to keep track of it. Like any field of science, people report things in papers. Sometimes they wait until the paper is actually accepted by some peer review. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes people do find the same planet and argue about it. The, the most recent NASA mission, actually, they did a public release of the data. And two groups are trying to scoop each other and see who can find the same planet. Um, First, so it's a little competitive in a in a field, but yeah, you try to keep track of it, and and there's only about three thousand on this, so it's not impossible to search the catalogs and find out if people have seen it before. That's happened to us too. We've we've found something, and then then like the next day before we finished um, even starting to write the paper, somebody else announced it. Very frustrating, but um, but it's not all about scooping the enemy, so it's okay. Um, that's a good question. So um, most of these systems, I'm going to say the majority are probably we only see one planet. That doesn't mean there aren't more planets in that system, but it could mean that the others are not exactly aligned. So it, but there's a bunch of systems, and I'm going to show a video of this in a second, that do have multiple planets. So it probably represents about 2,000 stars, in order to find which they had to look at several hundred thousand stars many of which may still have planets, but just not lined up right for the various techniques that they used. So, 
So, so right now we tend to find one or two or three or the record is six planets around a single star, but most of the time we only get to see one. Yep. The, the majority of these were discovered by a, a NASA mission called Kepler. And it basically looked at the same 100,000 stars. It had a, a several hundred megapixel camera. And so it just stared at a piece of sky kind of the size of your, of your hand at arm's length. And it stared there at it for about three and a half years before the spacecraft started to have trouble. Um, so really, really, really patient, just staring at the same star. And if you think about it, if you want to, you know, how long does the Earth take to go around the sun? One year. So if you want to find the Earth and you want to see it more than once, you've got to look for two years ideally three years, because you really would like to see it block the star a couple of times in a row so you're really sure what you've seen. Um, and so you need a duration like that. Jupiter takes 12 years to go around the sun. So they have, they didn't have, their mission didn't last long enough to see the equivalent of Jupiter, um, for example. Whereas with what we do with the imaging, you don't have to wait the whole time. You just see the planet, come back to see that it moved a little bit to be sure that it's orbiting. You don't have to wait for the whole thousand years, which is good, because they want to wait for a thousand years. Yep. Oh, uh, where even are the purple? I'm, so another important fact to know about me is I'm red-green colorblind. So I will sometimes have trouble with, where are the purple ones? Uh, they're a bit to the left of the orange ones. Which I think up here. There's a mix of purple and blue, right? It's like straight, a little ways above Uranus. And oh, that guy's timing. Um, as opposed to these are mostly the micro lens color, right? Good. Um, I can't even blame anybody else because I made this figure. I just picked <laughs> colors for um, stuff that I, I pay attention to. So um, uh, yeah, exoplanet detection techniques. Again, we'll, we'll cover these in more detail. Um, the timing one is a very cute trick that people use where, so imagine you have one of these transiting planets. It's going around and around and again and again and again and again like this. So every day, it passes in front of the star. As you know, light takes time to travel. So when you're seeing it, if it's a star far enough away, it actually meant it passed in front of it a thousand years ago. You're just seeing the light from that arrive at you now. If I move the star closer to you by a lot, um, you would see the transit not that took place a thousand years ago, but one that took place 900 years ago or so. If I moved it far away, you'd see transits further back in the past. Um, if the star is moving a little bit, the net effect of that is that you'll see transits happen a little bit early and a little bit late um, as the star, as the whole system moves back and forth with respect to the gravity of the other planets. So it's effects like that. I think it also encompasses, as I say that, I think I'm also, another effect that's involved is if there is a planet going around here and there's another one you can't see, its gravity will still kick the first planet around a little bit. And so the transits might arrive a little early or late as the other planet makes it speed up or slow down. So it's effects like that. It's timing. Or, um, yeah, there are a couple of other variations on this, but I think I'll defer those until we talk about pulsars and, and other exotica. Um, and I'm also going to defer microlensing before you get the chance to, to ask about it, because um, those are very complicated techniques. OK, other questions? All right. Um, one, another thing I want to highlight um, as a theme in the class yeah, there's a disturbing lack of planets right where Earth is, but that's set not because they're not there, but because our technology isn't quite there. But we can see planets close to, to where Earth is in this diagram. And what close means is that there's a chance at least that those planets could be habitable. We'll talk about this, and in fact, we'll do the math for it. But what makes the Earth habitable is that we're getting just the right amount of sunlight. And the amount of sunlight we get determines the temperature of the Earth in combination with things like the greenhouse effect that, that for now, keeps the temperature um, fairly reasonable. Um, we would think if you want to have a planet that's habitable, it's got to get about the same amount of sunlight that the Earth does, which in turn, if it was orbiting a star like the sun, which not all stars are, would mean it would have to be, I feel really bad about all the people behind the pillar. I'm, I'm yeah, still getting used to the space. Um, would mean that, that the star has to be kind of, the planet would have to be kind of in this range. Too close, it would get too much sunlight, it would be baked. Too far away, it would freeze. There's what's sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks zone, the reason that the region that's just um, fairly close to the star. Similarly, if the planet's too small, we'll find out why. It probably won't have an atmosphere. If the planet's too big, it would have sort of crushing gravity and not be, be particularly habitable or maybe be made out of stuff that you couldn't even live on. So there's a narrow range in which habitable planets could exist. 
a range that we're just barely scraping with our current techniques, but scraping well enough that we can say, you know, I can't say that 27% of stars have a planet in their habitable zone. I can say that that number is probably between 5 and 20%. And that's a number 30 years ago I would have had to say that that number is somewhere between 0.1% um, and 90%. And so we now we know roughly 1 in 10, maybe it's 1 in 5, maybe it's 1 in 20 of stars have a planet that's kind of the right size and kind of the right distance from the sun. I don't know what they're made out of. They might not be nice planets like Earth, but I know that they're at least out there. And I can imagine what 10 years from now, 20 years from now is going to let us tell if they really are nice planets like Earth. OK, and this is just as a cool animation for the, the question about multiplicity. This is every multi-planet system found by the Kepler mission as of, um, uh, I think, just um, the 2012 that's in it. And with our solar system for scale. So our solar system is sitting here, Mercury, Venus, Earth going around it, um, Mars, Jupiter. You can see some of these differences. All these other solar systems are full of big planets close to their star, which we don't see in our solar system. And they're really packed really densely. They have inside where our solar system just has empty space. Again, let's go to the, the classroom metaphor. So if, if our solar system was in this classroom, we'd have the grapefruit here. We'd have a couple of, of dots um, towards the back of the classroom. These other solar systems, we'd have the grapefruit here, and we'd have a bunch of grapes kind of somewhere around the front row of the classroom. Maybe not that much denser to, to, scale, to scale, but but astronomically speaking, much, much more tightly packed. So all these other solar systems are just weirdly different than our own in ways that we still don't, um, still don't understand. And you can also see the color coding for some estimate of the temperature of the planet based on how much light it's going to get from its star. How close it is, also how hot the star is, and we'll look at that math later. So the questions um, that we'll answer by the end of the class, how did we find these? Well, actually, we have pretty much answered those questions, so we can stop the class now. Not quite. Um, what do we know about them? What don't we know? Where did they come from? Why are they different than our solar system? And the big one, how common are planets like Earth? And is life common or rare throughout the, the universe? OK. I'm going to try the, the poll thing again. We'll see how it works. I may give up and use the clickers. but um, OK. So. Let's imagine we constructed our model solar system, grapefruit here, a bunch of tiny berries scattered throughout the Stanford campus. Where are we going to put the next star? So on the scale, the next star closest to the sun, um, uh, or the next, next star like the sun, so it would be another grapefruit. On our scale model, where are we going to put that other grapefruit? So let me see if I can make the poll live. Um, Definitely got to experiment with the edges. So I think I can deactivate this. Uh, there we go. You're deactivated. Yeah, I really got to figure out how to use this better. And I can activate how far away the nearest star is. In principle, there's a, this is also, as you can tell, new this year. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to hide this so you don't bias your answers, which means I've got to go back to my slides. OK, so on the scale of our solar system, so you should, all see, you should all see that where you saw the previous one. Does everybody successfully see it? So you know, just sort of make a, a guess. And we don't really have quantitative information to inform our guesses yet. But where would you put the next grapefruit, basically? Um, and so pick an answer, even if you feel like it's a completely arbitrary pick. And then after I've seen the distribution of answers, we'll take a second to discuss it. Six, 60 responses. Pretty good. OK, yeah, why don't we um, take advantage of the fact that we have these tables and, and just pick the either you know, break up, in, up into one to two groups per table, take two minutes, and talk about the scale with the people around you. And, um, <laughs> it's also interesting just to see how other people's thoughts drive their answers. the back and apologize to people again for a while. Uh. 
We apologize again for how hard it must be to hear what's going on in the, or see what's going on in the back. Not too bad? Okay. Theoretically, the technology exists to let me stand there, but my Mac wouldn't talk to the, the wireless presenter system. But I'm hoping we'll, we'll make some progress on that. Yeah. Um, Disconcerting. Uh, should I answer that question? Yeah, four. So. Four. 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 Okay. Yeah. I want to get this wrapped up. Got to get the integration working. A good discussion goal might be to at least identify the answers that are obviously wrong, um, of which there might be a couple. If we get everybody out of the obviously wrong. I mean. Okay, just um, for, for first lecture and because this isn't a question we can discuss in detail, I'll, I'll adjust the discussion. Feel free to, I think you can adjust your answers. I've never actually tried this again, haven't tried the software, but if you feel like you've come to a different consensus answer after talking to your friends and neighbors, feel free to, to push the button. And I will figure out how to display this. Not too bad. Uh, yeah, I definitely have to work on the integration for this better. but. Um, so there's still a range of answers, which is not surprising because we haven't developed the tools yet to answer questions like this. Um, pretty much everybody would recognize that it's not on campus. That would be like having another solar system kind of overlapping with our own. Um, that's generally bad. The planets would crash into each other, stuff like that. Um, even the Palo Alto scale, where the other solar system would be somewhere like here, um, isn't the way the universe we live in works. That if that would be nice if it was, because we can send probes to pretty much every planet in our solar system, it wouldn't be that much harder if you could reach um, Pluto sitting over somewhere around the, the garages on Via Ortega. Yeah, you know, it wouldn't be that much longer to walk to downtown Palo Alto. You could imagine reaching the two of them on a reasonable time scale. We're not that lucky. If other solar systems were on the scale of San Francisco, again, if you could successfully walk um, to, to the planets in our solar system, you could probably walk to them. We're not that lucky either. Not even the Los Angeles scale. If, the other so if stars are the size of grapefruits, the nearest other grapefruit is in Washington, DC. So our solar system is pretty sparse. It's like this classroom with two pieces of fruit in it. The galaxy, the space between stars, is incredibly sparse. Stars are very separated compared to solar systems. I can't even, literally cannot meaningfully draw it. If that was our solar system, I would have to be drawing the other solar system somewhere in downtown Palo Alto. So the, the biggest break in scale, the biggest change in the scale of, of things really comes from this realization that there's so much empty space between stars, um, for better or worse. Come on. See if I can get that back. OK. People were asking about the numbers for it, just to finish up. And I talked about natural units. Some of you might have been trying to do the calculation in like how many kilometers it is to the nearest star or astronomical units or something like that. Even the astronomical unit turns out to be a bad natural unit for other stars. So the next natural unit that we'll use that you've heard about is the light year. And it pretty much does what it says on the tin. It's, it's the distance that light would travel in a year. It's not a bad metric. If you're a, a medieval society, you might use the person day as a measure of distance, because that tells you whether another city is somewhere you can reach in a day, a week, a month like that, using the speed of travel of something. We do the same thing, but we use the speed of travel of light. You can do the calculation to figure out how many kilometers is. It's a lot. It's not, I should emphasize, I'm never going to expect people to memorize numbers like this. If you need numbers they're going to on midterms, they're going to show up on, a, on an equation sheet. Um, but it's not even a, I mean, I, could, I don't have this number memorized. I can't say what it is. I could work it out if I had to. Um, but I, what I do know is it's kind of the right unit for distances to stars. The nearest star is about four light years away from us. So light from it takes about four years to reach there. 
And on this scale, that corresponds to the Washington, D.C. scenario. If you do the math, that's sort of around um, 300,000 light AU. But uh, let's see. One last footnote as a unit. Light years, though they're a nice unit for classes like this, they're not the unit that astronomers naturally use. We use a different unit of distance called a parsec, mostly because it makes math easier. And astronomers, it turns out, are not as good at math as, as physicists. It's about three and a third light years. But for this class purpose, we'll do distances in light years for, for everything we have to measure, just because it's what you're used to hearing from science fiction shows and, and um, contexts like that. But if you hear somebody talk about a parsec, about three light years um, is the next step. So we'll stop there, let everybody go. Hopefully you had a good first class. I'm happy to answer questions.